Morning, Facebook friends. Helen Arcantu here, CEO of the YWCA of Northern New Jersey. We're starting at 11.11. That's a good sign for a great conversation for sure. And good energy out into the universe. Um, you know, I'm so uh, happy that we're able to bring this conversation to you today. As we know, YWTV is about educating and inspiring um, our viewers and our community. And uh, I, you know, believe that this is a conversation that we should always be having. We're having it right now, um, but it isn't, uh, and it, the conversation is about um, children and anxiety. And I know a lot of children are experiencing anxiety right now because of this time that we're living in and what COVID has kind of created for us. But the conversation we're having now is a little bit different than that. It's about children having anxiety during times that are not COVID. Um, as well as times that are COVID, but we're, we're talking about a, a different um, trend, a growing trend. Um, and when I when we say it's growing, it's probably, you know, one of those things that we know more now, so we see more now. It's not necessarily that the numbers are changing. We're just able to see it and identify it and hopefully support it better. And I'm so grateful to have these two wonderful women with us today who have um, who are willing to share their life experience around raising children who were impacted with anxiety. So we can just jump right into the conversation. So we know um, that social relationships and you know social distancing has you know uh, halted our time. Um, and we know that we're eager to get back to regular interactions. But again, this anxiety we're talking about today is not COVID related. Um, what we know from the National Institute of Health, nearly one in three adolescents ages 13 to 18 will experience anxiety disorder. And this is even pre-COVID. This is not a number that's measured from, from this time. Um, and these numbers have been steadily rising uh, in children and at younger ages where children are becoming chronically anxious. And when children are an anxious, even the most well-intentioned parents can fall into a negative cycle. Knowing what to do and knowing what not to do can make a really big difference in helping your child get through these struggles. And I'm very grateful, as I said, to have these two wonderful women join us today to be able to share their firsthand experience. And I want to introduce them to you, and then I want to jump right into the conversation. So um, we have Julia Orlando, who is the director of Bergen County Housing, Health, and Human Services Center in Hackensack. It's um, an agency that under Julia's leadership has become nationally recognized, and the mission is to end homelessness in Bergen County. In addition to her work there, obviously, she's an expert in homelessness. She's received numerous awards locally and nationally for her work to end this epidemic. She's also a former YWCA gala honoree. And just last week, she was at our Healing Space team, um, giving them a um, amazing uh, conversation and, and a workshop on mental health. Uh, so she's got this, you know, wonderful, she's, she's wonderful to engage for those conversations as well, if anyone's looking for a great speaker there. And I also am so grateful to have join us Andrea Uida, who is the co-founder with her husband, Herb, of the Todd Uida Children's Foundation. Um, which has been championing, championing children's mental health for the past 19 years. The foundation was established after their son Todd was killed at the age of 25 in the September 11th terrorist attacks um, in the World Trade Center. It was his family's way of meeting evil with good and creating a meaningful legacy for Todd, who struggled with anxiety as a pre-adolescent. So ladies, thank you so much for taking time to be part of this conversation. And I know that you're both very strong advocates and out in the community talking about this issue. And I'm just appreciative that you're here to be, you know, to share your experiences. So we know a lot of moms um, with children have experienced the same um, issues that you are dealing with. And um, they're not always sure what's going on. It may not be diagnosed. Um, they may not know what's bringing it on. Um, parents can feel helpless and they may be unsure how to support their child. So I really appreciate you both sharing your stories to help guide parents a little bit. And Andrea, maybe we can start with you. Um, tell us a little bit about Todd and what he experienced as a young boy. 
Thank you for having me and thank you for um, addressing this topic. And I think, <clears throat> first of all, I have to say that um, when I dealt with this problem with my son, it was 35 years ago. So in a sense, I think a lot of things have changed, but in another sense, a lot of things have not changed. And so Tal was nine years old. He was in the fourth grade. Um, he'd been a happy kid playing with the kids on the block, riding his bike, being all over the place. And one day he grabbed the leg of the dining room table, turned absolutely white and said, I'm not going to school. And we hadn't seen it coming, which is, I think, what made it so difficult. Um, and, and we realized he wasn't going to school. <laughs> I don't think we could have pried him away from that, that table leg. So we, um, we right away looked for a doctor for him to see, for a therapist. And we had some difficulty with that. We worked with one child psychiatrist for a year who um, was not helpful. And luckily we um, made the decision to switch. And then we, then we met a wonderful doctor who was really, really sourced in this whole journey with Todd. So what, what was so unnerving to us was that um, we talked about it. We, we didn't think it was a secret. And I, maybe because he wasn't even able to go to school, people had to recognize it. You know, we couldn't really keep it a secret if we wanted to. But, but that was, um, people thought he was manipulative. They didn't understand about childhood anxiety and depression. And, you know, they, they thought he was being manipulative. That was a big part of it or they would see him doing something. We could barely get him out of the house um, at, in the beginning. And if they did see him someplace, they would say, oh, well, he could go there. Why can't he go to school? So it was very upsetting that there was no understanding of it at all. Um, and, I, and I had met a woman whose grandson, granddaughter was going through the same thing and not getting help. And as Todd was starting to get better, I kept thinking of this woman whose child, grandchild, was going to get stuck, you know, because if you don't deal with it, um, one of the things we've tried to do with Todd's foundation is really emphasize the importance of early intervention. And, you know, th there are some kids, like I said, we didn't really see anything with Todd. Maybe we missed it. I don't know. But with some children, you do see it very young, even in toddlers, three and four year olds. And people say, oh, how could a four year old be depressed? But they can. Mm. And it's better to recognize it and have some kind of intervention so that it doesn't get worse and worse and come back. Because it will come back. It may get better, but it will come back if it's not dealt with. Well, that's that's um that's an important thing you just said there, and something that you know parents listening should remember that you know these things don't just dissipate and go away; that they they stay and remain, and um, you know they will resurface even if they kind of fluctuate a little bit. They they absolutely will resurface, so they need they need that intervention. Julie, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with your son and how you you know identified and recognized this issue? Sure. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for having me on today. And it's just such an honor to be on with, with Andrea, uh, who's just um, a wonderful advocate and, and friend and colleague in this work. Um, and first, I have to say that I spoke with Anthony before I came on today um, to respectfully ask him, is it OK if I go on a live broadcast and talk about your Issues, your history. And he said, of course, mom, he said, if you think that it's going to help someone else, then feel free to tell my story. And, and I just love and respect him so much for that, because that really is the whole point of the stigma free movement is that 
because some of us are willing to speak openly about this, we can end that stigma. Um, we don't have to hide it. So I, I thank you. And, and on behalf of Anthony, I'm, I'm happy to discuss this with you. Um, now with, with Anthony, you know, being, being a mental health professional, when you have children, you're looking for stuff the second they're breathing. Every single thing they do, is that wrong? Is that off? Is that, especially if you have any kind of history in your family and, and so to speak that that's not unusual, but sometimes knowledge is a dangerous thing because you know, you're out with the DSM, you know, and you're looking and does it meet this criteria? What's going on here? I think with Anthony is it, it did not present his anxiety at all. He was a very healthy little boy. Um, with Anthony, it was very early on that he was actually showing exceptional traits and delayed traits all at the same time. It was very confusing. I walked into his room when he was two and a half and he was reading an entire book out loud. And I thought, oh my gosh, like, I wasn't like, oh, my child's a genius. I was like, I, and I remember going and saying, you know, immediately I said, there's, there's just something unusual about this because even though that was going on, there were some social delays. There were some other things. And as a, as a very young child, I actually had him in to therapy and they were, and this is the danger here. It doesn't always show up as anxiety. It can look like other things. And so it's very hard with the toddler who's developing to say, is this normal? So we saw some delays there, always kind of kept my eye on it. So what, what do you do back then? And Andrea knows what I'm talking about. You have speech therapy. A lot of things were focused around speech therapy, but his speech was perfect. There was nothing wrong with his speech patterns. He was also an exceptional speller and he was very smart. And everyone kept saying to me, he's just, he's just really, you know, you, you have your in-laws, your mother-in-law, he's just so smart, he's just so smart. But I think as parents and especially as mothers, we internally know when there's something not right. And I remember him going off to school and saying to the administration, just, I, I think there's something not right, can you let me know? And we brought in um, an expert uh, which is now kind of more well-known, which is an ABA specialist who was brought into the school and helped give him prompts, like to help give him prompts about um, with other children. It was, it was a very big social issue. Um, that was a bold move on our part because it was like telling all the other parents, I've got this, this specialist. But for me, just like Andrea said, early intervention, you know, we can, you know, you know, if our children have a medical issue, we don't waste any time. You know, we get right in there. If our child has diabetes, if our child has uh, cancer, if our child is sick, we get right. We don't, we don't delay that. Sometimes when it's mental health, we delay it. Oh, maybe it'll, 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 you know, it'll just resolve itself and all of that. And so there's a lot of anxiety on the parents' part to kind of move forward. Um, so we had him very early on connected to services, but it was not until he was an adolescent, I believe it was around 14, um, that he that he came to me one night hysterical and crying. And he's like, make it stop. And I thought, what is going on in my sweet child? Like what? And he came to me. And it was at that moment I knew that, okay, you know what? Whatever we're doing here is not working and this is something else. I also think there's a danger in that uh, professionals tend to over-diagnose autism and they think every single thing that's happening to a child might be autism. And it's important to know if it is or not because anxiety may be part of autism, but it's its its, its own thing. So we did not get a proper diagnosis until much later for Anthony around this age. So it was around this age that I got him to a psychiatrist, therapist and all of that. And I will be honest, I went through several different doctors uh, before finding the right one. But, you know, we can get to that later in the conversation. But I think when my child came to me and said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. You have to help me. Um, I really felt like I had to, in earnest, um, move the needle on that. So you did both mention that you went through a series of doctors and therapists and, you know, you tried different things. So. And, and I know that that is one of the areas that is so um, challenging for parents, right? Because, you know, you're relying on the experts, you know, to guide you. And when you're not feeling right about the experts, you have to have this moment with yourself. Is it them or is it me? You yeah. know, you know, is that, am I just, you know, being resistant or is it that the doctors are just not like connecting on this? 
how did you figure out which were the right treatments, you know, and most impactful treatments for your sons? And also, how did you deal with that, um, you know, that process, you know, as a parent of, of starting and stopping and starting and stopping doctors? Because I know that sometimes it's also what makes parents give up because they just can't, you know, manage that part of it. I, I think another thing that we have to um, look at is what impact that can have on family relationships when you have a child who is obviously, I have two other children, and when one child obviously becomes the focus of attention. Um, if you have a spouse, it can be very difficult. Whose fault is it? Yeah. You're, you're looking for fault. Why did this happen? And you blame yourself and you blame the other person. Mm -hmm. So that can be very difficult. And then, as I say, we had two children <clears throat> who were a little bit older. He was nine, they were about 13 and 14. Um, and they saw all this attention being paid to Todd. And, you know, he was home all the time. Um, in the beginning, he was not going to school as a regular student. He was having a two to come to the home. Um, fortunately, he was bright, and so he didn't lose any time in those two and a half years that he was basically home. Um, and the other children, like part of them was like, he's such a pain in the neck. <laughs> and because there were times we would go, like on a holiday, we would go to someone's house, a family member's house, and he would have to leave. Like at some point, he would have to leave. And, and you couldn't not take him home. And if you were an hour away from home, you couldn't just leave the other two kids there and go pick them up. You all had to leave. So it has its impact on the family too. And, and he was a pain in the neck to them, but I know they, and they've told me this, they wanted so much for him to be better because they felt so sorry for him that he wasn't having a normal experience. Mm -hmm. So I swerved away from the question you asked. <laughs> well, that's an important piece, and I definitely wanted to get to it. So maybe before we go back to that, the, the first question, you know, Julia, can you speak to that too? Because I know that, you know, Anthony wasn't an only child also, and, you know, you were doing this, you know, with your husband as well. So I, I'd be curious to hear your, you know, compliments to what Andrea just shared. You know, it's, it's very tough when you are a mental health professional and your spouse is not and because their attitude although we have other people that have anxiety issues very clearly in both of our families um and and not just that helen but a lot of this stuff that we were doing was not covered by insurance yeah and the investment for um this kind of treatment that we were doing was expensive but i really felt like it, it, it mattered. And so making that those kinds of decisions were really hard. And I have a younger child who's actually in, in college whose upbringing was overshadowed by his older brother being different. And, um, you know, I, I always tried to be sensitive to that because like Andrea said, it's, it's the family dynamic changes, whether, whether that's whatever is going on with, if there's a child that's ill in some way, there's going to be a disruption in the in the family dynamics. Um, and what I can tell you is that just to transition to the to the question about treatment, um, one of the most difficult things for me is when when he finally came to me in adolescence, the first thing I did was call his pediatrician who was wonderful, had a great relationship, and sent us to a doctor, sent us to a psychiatrist, which is the appropriate referral. He met with Anthony and the first thing he said is, okay, we're gonna start medication. And uh, even myself, mm -hmm. I reacted to that. I thought, we're not gonna do therapy, we're not gonna do anything, we're just gonna give, and here's my young son and I'm going to give him medic. And I think this is where a lot of parents get stuck because the idea of giving your child medication for anything is, is a big, big decision. And I have to be honest with you that I said to the doctor, I'd like to try some therapy first. I'd like to give him some other tools additionally. And the doctor's reaction was, well, I don't want anything to do with you. I'm not gonna see him if he doesn't take medication. And that was a big turnoff for me. So, you know, we then found um, a different doctor who he's still with today. 
and connected him to a specialist in obsessive compulsive disorder. And, and I think it's really important that we're not just like, what are, there's different kinds of anxiety disorders. Some children have phobias. Some, people, some children have general anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. My son had very specifically obsessive compulsive disorder, which when we understood that and we saw it, um, getting a specialist to, who still works with him today made all the difference. Um, and we did go to medication. But it was when he was ready, you know, he wanted to try therapy first because what you really see with 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 these disorders is it's the combination of the medication which will allow for the treatment to be successful. But it has to be together. And this therapist actually worked with this doctor. They specialize with young people um, in their practice. And I and then I had a little more trust when when we were able to move past that. But a lot of it had to do with involving my child in it. That's very tough when they're younger, you know, but when they are adolescent and they're in their, in their teens, you can certainly um, involve that in that process. But I think that's one of the most difficult thresholds for parents is going to be that decision a around medication. The, <clears throat> the irony with us was that the first child psychiatrist we called because he had been highly recommended to us was not taking new patients. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> excuse me. And so someone else recommended, I can't remember, it's a long time ago, I can't remember how we got the recommendation of the second person. He was a Columbia Pres Presbyterian, came highly recommended. We figured, okay, we're in good hands. The first thing he did was put Todd on medication. Now this is 35 years ago. Um, we knew nothing and we said, okay. And we, we still, I mean, a year, you, you'll ask why we waited a year. And again, it's because you feel that they know what they're doing. And we did not have, I mean, I feel now, I know so much about this topic, but I didn't know anything then. And he wasn't eating well. It, it was a terrible, terrible year. Day by day, it was a very difficult year. And when my husband finally said to the doctor, we don't think this is working. We think we need to try a new doctor. He said, I don't blame you. <laughs> and I thought, oh my God. And he never really did any therapy with Todd. And, and, and you know, we talked to him about that. I, I don't know. It was a lost year. It was a lost year. So now I recalled the first doctor and he was able to see us. The first thing he did was take Todd off the medication. He did not believe in, to this day, it is the absolute last resort in his mind to put a child on medication. Yeah. So he took him off the medication. And he started seeing him four times a week. Now, when you talk about the financial part of it, <laughs> um, my husband had a good job. He had good insurance. Even so, four times a week, um, we took a second mortgage on the house. And, and we just felt whatever we have to do, we have to do. Mm -hmm. it's, it's this child's life we're talking about. Yeah. So. Yeah. So he saw Todd four times a week, and at first, Todd would only go in with me and stay 10 minutes. <laughs> and so I would drive 20 minutes, stay 10 minutes, go back home. And this went on, and pay top dollar. And this went on for a while, and finally he would go in alone for 10 minutes. <laughs> and so it was a very gradual process, but in a year and a half, he got Todd to a place where he went back to school full time. He was, you know, a, a scholar athlete in high school. He went to the University of Michigan. He got a great job when he graduated from Michigan. I mean, he, my husband always says he never looked back. And, and I feel that that's true. Of course, a part of me always wonders, he was 25, maybe when he was 30, he would have had an anxiety episode. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But he was really, he really went through an analysis, which you don't think of a child doing. But this is, 
this is what he needed apparently. Well, I appreciate you sharing the depth of what your families, you know, struggled with and, and went through, you know, even to, you know, remortgaging your house. And Julia, can you share also the story? And of course, because I happen to know you both, so I know a lot about, you know, we've had a lot of conversations individually as well um, about how it impacted your career trajectory, you know, and choices that you made as well. Because I, I really appreciate Andrew sharing what you just shared because, you know, families have to make some tough decisions, you know, around supporting their children with these issues. And, um, you know, I just want them to know that, you know, we, we see them, we hear them, we understand, and, um, you know, you can come out the other end of them, you know, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of the things I, if anyone's watching this that is thinking about their child, and if they're like me, the thing I wanted was a crystal ball. I wanted someone to tell me that when I come out the other end of this, my child's going to be okay. And that's all any of us want. So I think that Andrea has said that. And what I can tell you about my son, because we did get him the, the treatment. When, when you go through therapy, any kind of therapy that helps you develop insight, that gives you strategies and tools to overcome challenges and obstacles. Think about how well prepared you're making your child for the world. So when my son with this OCD went to his uh, very good college, he was more prepared than any of this, uh, uh, anybody else there. Like I didn't worry about him. Now you would think you would be worried, but I was like, oh no, this, this kid has had therapy. He's insightful. He knows to meditate. He, he watches his diet. He understands the relationship with food and his body and his moods. He's a runner. He learned how to, the importance of physical activity. So I sent off this child to a much, to much more prepared. I'll just give you an example. His like, freshman year, they, they had like a little outbreak of like um, roaches in the in in his in his dorm room which is pretty normal in college um and the roommate had like a breakdown like couldn't handle and here's my son having him breathe having him work and i just thought that's pretty fantastic that's wonderful <laughs> you know to to the other end where he was overseas in london at the beginning of the pandemic and so when you have a child who has ocd one of the manifestations of it is they wash their hands a lot. There's this obsession with germs. So think about this. We spent lots of money and lots of time to get to extinguish that behavior that now we are telling him to do. And I said to him, you know, Anthony, you have to appreciate the irony of this. You have to learn to laugh. You know, he was like, he said, he goes, unbelievable, mom. And I remember him asking his therapist, so how much do I wash my hands? And she said, wash them good, but don't scrub in for surgery. You yeah. know, you have to have a little bit of a sense of humor, but the irony was, you know, he was he was across the world and we, I would call him every day and he'd be like, I'd be like, do you, do you wanna come home? And he'd be like, no, I'm gonna challenge myself because that's what they learn in therapy is mm -hmm. overcome the thing you're afraid of. Helen, if we could teach everybody to overcome the thing they're afraid of, um, how, how important that is. So I think for me, my trajectory in my career, and not even just my career, but also as a mom, was I became very involved in, in sports. I, I believe that, you know, I did a lot of photography in the school. Andrea knows this about me. Um, my child, being connected socially was so important to me because this disorder, it, it manifests itself a lot of times in a social disorder. So being very involved, being very connected and the, the stigma free movement, I jumped on that because I thought, I wish I would have had a me when I was dealing with this when he was younger. I, the only people I could go to were people whose children had developmental disabilities. They didn't have advocates and, and people who spoke on this. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be that person. I, I thought, you know, if, if there's not something, then make it, right? If there's something missing in our environment, let's be that change. Um, really important for me. Um, you know, and, and from that also has come, um, 
the, the trainings. I'm a mental health training background. And now I see the intersection of mental illness that's untreated and poverty. And, you know, we have all of our injustices and prejudices and discrimination that's going on. And now I have 18, 20 year old children. I still call them children that are homeless now that are struggling with all kinds of issues because we didn't intervene, right? We, we didn't intervene when we needed to. So um, on behalf of my son, but also, you know, I have a brother who died this past summer who also struggled with mental illness. And I really uh, navigated a lot of my career has been around, was around helping him. And I, I think that if, if you're passionate about something and you also believe in something, um, I think that's so important. And all I can say to everybody looking for a crystal ball, uh, Anthony's a senior at a wonderful college. He His last um, report card, uh, if we still say that, mm -hmm. uh, was a 4.0. He's incredibly smart. He's, he's, he's double majoring. He's well-adjusted. He has a wonderful sense of humor. And for his, um, his capstone uh, project, he had to do a film. And his film was actually about it was actually a little bit of a horror film but it was it was really about his belief mm -hmm. that um mental illness is very negatively portrayed in film and and he as a, as an aspiring writer and uh would like to write for film wants to create things that don't continue that stigma and you know what helen and andrea you really can't ask better for that than you know, he's going to go out there into the world and, and make things that are, you know, um, that help to destigmatize. You kind of feel like, check, check, um, you know, I've done my job. And I'm just so glad that even with all of the, um, the difficulty it was that I did those interventions because he's so much better for it, that we can make our children better. We can help them, as Andrea said, with her own son. Um, they can go on to lead wonderful lives. But it is going to be work to get them there. Well, I, I really appreciate you sharing that journey and the details around it, both of you, because again, I know that there's so many parents that are struggling with this and feel alone and wonder because they don't have that crystal ball, but you know, want to know that they're going to come out the other end. And you know, every story is different and we know that, but the two of you really are sharing, you know, the importance of getting good treatment, getting early intervention, and, you know, really having it be a, a group effort within the family, you know, from what you both have described, um, you know, everybody being aligned and, you know, connected together to be able to, um, you know, help support your child through this. And I, I there's two things I want to make sure that we cover before we leave each other. And one is, what support did the two of you get, you know, to get through this? Because you're describing so much and you know one of the things i'm so struck with and i i have been for years knowing the two of you and even more so now sitting here and hearing your stories next to each other you know very often you know women find their voices and become advocates because of something that's happening and presents in their family right you know it's not necessarily a role that you would have thought for yourself or imagined that you were going to be doing before this all you know appeared but yet, you know, you're you you have to become an expert on something, and then you know a, a natural progression ends up being sharing it with others, you know, to help others. How did you how did you get support along the way to be able to, and what kind of support was that, and what message would you have for you know for moms and parents, you know, that are in that space to get to be able to keep themselves, you know, and strong and stable and consistent, you know, through what you're describing as a lifetime, obviously, of a, a process. Mm -hmm. I, I think I, I, it's, it's interesting you ask that because I was going to say that in relation to what Julia was talking about. Um, when Todd died, his, his doctor came to visit us and he asked us, would you be willing to talk to parents who are going through this? Because People don't have anyone to talk to. Yeah. And, and we have done that. And whenever people hear our story, um, wherever we are or we happen to be, or story, I get calls from people. And, and, you know, we encourage that because I really didn't have anyone 
that I didn't know anybody going through the same thing. Um, because maybe people were, but they didn't talk about it. Right. I had one friend who called me almost every day. And it almost sounds like that would be annoying. <laughs> but, but it wasn't because I just knew whatever I went through that day, I could share with her. And, and her son also had some anxiety, so she could relate to it somewhat. Um, but yeah, it's, it's important. It's important not to keep it hidden. I, I think that's, that's the main thing. And then people can reach out to you. And we, we do belong to a church that was very supportive. People in our church were while we went through this. And that, that's yeah. a comfortable space for us. So we felt comfortable sharing it with people and they were very supportive. I agree with Andrea. I think that, you know, for me, and I think this is the woman thing, Helen, uh, women support, you know, we have, I have a, a best friend who's spe in special ed. She's a special ed teacher. So um, she was an enormous, um, she was an enormous support to me um, during those times. But I believe I can honestly say that I know that after this is airing, I'm going to have people reach out to me. But I know it's going to happen because I become a safe space. Yeah. So if I say I have had a child with an anxiety disorder, 10 other people will come up to me. If I, and wherever I'm speaking, whether it's about homelessness, um, MS advocacy, all, all these different things that have happened in my family, um, you make it, you make a safe space. And I think that when you do that, people like there, it goes off in their brain. And, and like Andrea knows that when we do like stigma free events, we'll put months into planning and we might have four or 10 people come. And we always say, we don't care because if we help one person, if we help one person not take their own life, one person know where to go for their child, you know, if, if, if we can get out into our community, then it's worth the effort that we're doing. You're not looking for mass numbers. And that's really about, about your community. So I think being bold enough to be the change you want to see, even though it means you're revealing something about yourself that's very uncomfortable, the good that it's going to do on the other side, it comes back to you tenfold because, because people are so grateful for you to give them that space to walk into with you and be like, you know, I've had them on the phone. I'm sure Andrea does too. People crying, people scared, people just not knowing. It's a beautiful thing to become that that safe person for another person. Um, and I think that that does heal the lonely wounds that I think Andrea and I may have had during those earlier years mm -hmm. when we didn't have that those people to go to where it wasn't safe to talk about this. It wasn't, you know, the world wasn't ready yet for us to talk about that. So that has helped me. By helping other people, it helps me. When we started Todd's foundation, because it wasn't something he talked about a lot the time he went through. Mm -hmm. He felt it was going to help someone. He would talk to them about it. Mm -hmm. And and he wrote his essay to Michigan, his application essay about this, this problem. And he, he said, the time you need to give up is when you have to persevere the most. And with family, you can overcome anything. Mm. And, and, and I said to my husband, so we're starting this foundation. <laughs> we're going to talk about the anxiety Todd had. And this is something he talked about a lot. And I wonder what he would think of this. Mm. And I thought at first he would say, what are you, crazy? <laughs> and then he would think and say, I'm glad you're helping other people. Yeah, I agree. And I know for Anthony, when he wrote his essay to college, it was about this. It was about um, how he dealt with it. And and when we first read the essay, I thought, oh my gosh, you're really putting it out there. You're putting out there like the, the, the horror that it, and I think that's his whole idea with film is it's a horror. For a child to go through, imagine if every if you have tons of thoughts fleeting into your head about if I touch this germ and I walk in my house, my parents are going to die. And that's what's in your head. I mean, that is torturous for a child. And it doesn't matter that they're smart and they know better. It's, it's, it's actually, the disorder is like a bully. 
it bullies them. And so to write this essay where he was so honest and he talked about running and he talked about how running was such, was so now Anthony never won a medal. He never won a race. He was maybe the last or second to last. It didn't matter. He was running with his friends. It was good for him physically. He loved being out there. And I just thought I could not do long distance running and and get up at you know the break of dawn and the rain and the I just right that I always admired him for that because it didn't matter that he was a champion he was an inward champion that every day that he got up and he fought this this internal thing was was wonderful for him and I will tell you that for those parents going through college when when my son was accepted to his dream college um they wrote a letter back and they said, we were so moved by your essay. And I thought, oh my gosh, they actually read his essay, right? Right, Andrea? Like they read thousands of essays and, and they quoted from his essay. And when, he, when, it was, when it was accepted Students Day, I went up to the dean and I said, I have to tell you, he got other acceptances, but I felt safe sending my son to your school because you got him, you understood the character he had and what he overcame. And, and he just looked at me and he said, we know our people, we know our students. And he has flourished there and he's done wonderfully there. And I think it's it, it's so important to not be afraid that they're not gonna find their way, that they're, that they're and, and you know what, colleges now, they, they're, they have so much, so many kids getting therapy that you, it's hard to even get an appointment. Like it's not a thing anymore. It's, it's pretty not normal for kids to now go to therapy in college because there's especially now with the pandemic and 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 all those kinds of issues so um i just i i, I even even the parts that are uncomfortable i think they internally know that you know this was my struggle this was my challenge this is how i overcame it because isn't that what life is about it's yeah. overcoming challenges it's not about when everything is easy it's, it's about when everything is hard and how we persevere past those times. And, and that's a lesson for all of us, not just for our children that have mental health issues. Well, that's for sure. And I, and you know, and I know we've been talking a long time, but I would be absolutely remiss in ending this conversation without asking you both to talk a little bit about your experience in working with the school districts with something like this, because, and again, I know we've been chatting for a while, but I, you know, I just know parents watching that that's one of the struggles. It's not only getting help for themselves, it's not only getting help for their child, but because they're that age that they are dealing with school and you both shared stories about your children not wanting to be there and, and how that manifested, how they presented, you know, how it was perceived. Um, how did you navigate the school districts and what advice would you have for parents around that piece of it? Well, I think that we were very fortunate um, because the child study team at our school was wonderful. And we had Todd Stock to come in and speak with them. And they all worked together. And I know not everybody has this experience. And this, as I say, was so long ago, but we were very fortunate. And, um, and yes, at first Todd was home with a tutor and then he would go into the resource room for a couple of months. And then he would go into his class only for math because that was his favorite subject. And so it was a very gradual return. And then boom, 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 I'm going to junior high school and that's it. Um, but we were fortunate that we had a child study team that worked with us. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's key. Yeah. Julia, what was your experience like? So, I mean, we did, we also went that route with child study, um, but again, it wasn't really understood I think what his needs were and, and what he needed, they really didn't have at that time, which was really more of the social piece and the ABA piece. Mm -hmm. I will say that what did help for, for me was not listening to the, to the folks that said to us, don't tell the teacher. What I would do is very early on, I started to go in and talk with the teacher very briefly and say, so this is, beca because this is the other thing, a child like my child was never a behavioral issue. And if you're not a behavioral issue, you're not a problem for the teacher, you can just kind of like go into like a deep, and, and his grades were good. Mm -hmm. No one was thinking there's a problem because what would happen is his anxiety during the day was so bad that he couldn't listen to the what was going on in school. So he would go home and then he would be overstudying to make up for not being able to, it was just a very bad cycle, which he 
eventually learned how to overcome and, and how to deal with, um, how to quiet that noise in your head. Um, but that's the danger. If, if your child is doing well, no one may pick up on it or the child's not a problem. So I would go into the teacher and say, listen, this is, you know, this is, you can tell when Anthony's not paying attention, maybe a gentle tap on his shoulder. Again, it's not paying attention because it's an ADD or ADHD. It was more of he's, bring him back, put your hands on the desk. We would have these little, and so early on we were going in and just helping the teachers understand just a little, just a little change, keep him up in the front of the class, not in the back of the class. So helping the teachers understand um, that, that manif you know, how to, how to do that was big. Today though, you do have stigma free. I mean, in Riverdale, Riverdale has stigma free. There are groups that they can become part of. They can wear their, we have line out groups in football. The first year I remember everybody had green on and I would like say to the kids, do you know what the green's for? They're like, no, but it's like really cool. But now they know what the lime green is for mental health. And so um, there are meditation groups. There are school districts that set up entire rooms for children to come when they're feeling overwhelmed. I mean, how beautiful that is. So now there's a lot more room and space to talk about this, to engage with the school. The teachers have had training. They've had mental health first aid. I'm a mental health first aid trainer. I went into the entire Pascac School Valley District and trained all their, their, their teachers during MLK year, uh, MLK day uh, about four years ago. So it's a different environment now, but in some ways it's not. So the, the real difference is there are more things to take advantage of, but we've got to make it okay for our child to, to take advantage of that. It's like, if you think about, remember the peanut free table? Yeah. And, and the stigma and the kids didn't want to sit at the stigma free at the, at the peanut free table because they had allergies. It's the same kind of thing where we have to make it okay. Uh, meditation and wellness and all of that is a good thing. It's not just for those kids or there's, you know, we have to, we have to normalize it. So the, the tools are there and we as parents have to encourage that and maybe even role model it, our own meditation, our own wellness, our own attention to health and, and be that, you know, so that our children see that these are good things to carry with us into adulthood. I appreciate that. And, and we'll put in the, in the comments here, links to the stigma free is how people can access their um, stigma free groups in their communities. One of the questions that you know did come in through Facebook was how people can access their stigma free groups. So um, we'll make sure and uh, you know we'll get from Julia and from Andrea the links so that we can put them here so people will know how to access them. And you know I I just I I'm just um, have so much gratitude to both of you for sharing your stories in um, you know such detail. And I, you know again we went longer than we normally do, but I felt it was so important out of respect for parents that are struggling with this issue um, because. There, there. We didn't even cover. I'm sure you know the, the the tip of the iceberg here, but at least we kind of touched on a couple of key areas. And the reality of it is, you are both in the community. You are both resources. And to our viewers, we encourage you. If there's someone in your life that you wish you know had seen this broadcast, it's very easy to share it with them. You can copy the link and send it. Um, you can share it to your Facebook page. You can copy the link and you know send it to um, you know an, an email or in a text to a friend. There are so many uh, you know so many ways to be able to get this conversation out. And it's so important. Um, we have a few questions coming in, but while I'm pulling them together, Andrea, could you talk a little bit about Todd's Foundation? Because um, I know I myself and you know Julia, you know we have both talked about how we've individually been beneficiaries. You know her family and you know um, I through the trainings that you all support in the community. I've been to so many of them and they're excellent and really have helped so many professionals. Um, you're doing so much good with, you. you know, with, you know, with taking this experience and moving it into the space of having a foundation. Could you share a little bit about that and where people can connect with you? And we'll put a link here as well. Sure. Um, we started the foundation, <clears throat> excuse me, basically the first, the first mission of our foundation was to help people financially who couldn't afford good mental health services because, as I said, it was a big expense. Not everybody could afford it. Um, and then we started to realize how important early intervention was. And then we started to realize how important it was to overcome the stigma 
And so that all became part of our mission of the foundation. We do hold, so we support about, um, I don't know, 15 or 20 different organizations that work on children's mental health. I mean, even it, locally, we support West Bergen Mental Health Care. We support Children's Aid and Family Services, um, YCS, the Infant Institute. Um, so we financially support agencies that help children um, with these issues. We also hold a conference every year at Montclair State University um, on the issues of child care and, um, you know, being aware of mental health issues in child care. And, and, and it goes into other things, like this year's conference will be on resilience mm -hmm. because we felt that's a big issue this year. Yeah. Yes, for sure. So we have, and then we also have an endowed lecture and research grant at the University of Michigan, where Taj um, went to school. And every year they bring in an expert from somewhere across the country, from some university who's doing research on these issues, and there's a lecture. And then they give seed money to one of their um, one of their either young professors or PhD students, and they give them seed money to start a project, a research project, which then when they've got it going, they can apply to the National Institute of Health for further funding. And so this has been going on for 19 years. And, um, and as I say, we do talk to people. People will contact us for help. And we'll try to direct them to someone who can help them. Or we'll, or we'll talk to them just to let them talk <laughs> and hear what they say. Thank you. And we have the link here. We just put it into the comments so that people can connect to it. We're having a lot of questions come in about resources and where you would recommend parents go to to find good, you know, therapists, good psychiatrists that focus on anxiety, um, you know, resources that would help parents learn more. Um, obviously, I, I know that your foundation is one place to go to for resources. And I know no one's, you know, we're not going to give individual referrals, but is there a network or a place where you would recommend parents go to to be able to access information? Um, Maybe bergenresources.net. Um, yeah. They tend to have a really good rundown. Um, I definitely think that referrals are, are good. Your own, you know, that's the other thing too, is that somebody who was good for me may not be good for someone else's right. child. But there's, there's always that. There, you, you have to kind of, uh, prepare yourself, you might have to switch. I had to switch maybe three times. Mm -hmm. One that I have now, he, you know, and, and, you know, now he only sees her every couple, you know, when he comes back every couple months, it's kind of like a check-in, right? It's like a well check, like, uh, or he can call her, but it's not, um, like Andrea said in the beginning, it was, for us, it was like twice a week. It was much more frequent than it is now. And, and, you know, we needed to do that. So I think bergenresource.net is a very good, uh, Andrea, are you familiar with other recommendations you want to no, add? I think, um, I think what we usually do, and that's pro maybe, maybe that's where we should be sending people. We'll usually send them to one of the agencies. Right, Care Plus New Jersey, CBH Care, Vantage Health, yeah, Health System, West Bergen. So, and I'm sure that, and we put the bergenresourcenet.org link into the comments here. Um, and it sounds like, though, even through that link, that they could get a wide range of these options that you all have mentioned and are talking about so that they can um, look. And is 211 a place to get information too, or is that too general? Um, I don't know if they have specific, but they'll definitely, you know, that is your state database. It's, it's, they'll direct you. Yeah, yeah it's, worth, it's worth it to try. Um, and, and then also talking with people you trust and you can certainly reach out to your local stigma free group. You know, I know for us and Andrea knows we've had speakers, um, we've had them present who are therapists, who are counselors, um, at the school and in the community, uh, which is great because then you can kind of talk with them and, and, and take a look at, um, the work that they do. I also think it's important to have a specialist, like for me, it was a, 
we had him working with therapists who their specialty was not obsessive compulsive disorder. So they really didn't understand the complexity of that and and really the the CBT that needed to go on and those kinds of things. Right. So don't just assume that it's like saying if you have a cancer diagnosis, you still need to go to a specialist, right, for that specific disorder. So which part of the body? And I think it's the same thing with mental health is really do a little bit of research and you can certainly ask your child study team. They also work with people that they recommend who have good experiences. It's 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 a little bit of research you have to do because and, and you may have to, you know, trial and error, see how it goes and and be willing to find that fit. Because when you find the fit, um, it gets a lot easier to move your child towards wellness uh, because because they'll develop the rapport. They'll have the trust um, and they can do the necessary work to 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 really um, learn how to manage. And that's the other thing, too. You're, you're not going to cure it. You know, this is not about curing it and it goes away and it never comes back. It's about managing it the same way you would manage diabetes, the same way you would manage any other uh, any other illness to the body. So it's something that really needs kind of a, a long term um, understanding um, at, to, to care for, for, for them and for you to care for yourself, too. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the message really is this is a marathon, you know, not a sprint, and that, you know, you, you all need to stay strong, you know, to support your child through this. And, you know, again, we're hearing, that, and you know, you can go back and read the comments yourself, too, but there's so many comments appreciative of you both sharing your stories. And again, I, I just want to reiterate, you know, my personal appreciation with you sharing your stories. I've always been so touched by my conversations with each of you and, and you know, how um, they've impacted um you know, how it's impacted your life, what you're, you know, you've experienced and how you've helped transition, you know, that experience to being able to support others. Um, so for those of you watching again, please be sure that you, um, you know, watch this again. This is one of those co the conversations you probably need to hear more than once. And, you know, please be sure to share it with people in your community um, that, uh, that, you know, that would benefit. And the reality of it is we don't even all know if it's us yet. <laughs> Um, I, I started out saying, you know, I, I have I have twins that are turning eight in just, you know, two two weeks. And um, being a mental health person myself, I'm always a little bit like Julia that I'm always watching, you know. Um, but uh, but you know, we just don't know, and it's important to have an awareness of these issues so that um, you know we can be able to be well positioned to help if it happens to be us or someone in our families, you know, that end up dealing with it. So with that, for everyone watching um, tomorrow, we hope you can join us. As uh, those of you who are YWTV regulars know, on um, Thursdays, we share the mic now with Black women in our community to amplify their voices. And I'm so looking forward to talking with Chef Kim Mills and um, sharing her um, life and lived experience with all of you. Uh, we do, you know, one of the things that you heard here that was so key and important is, you know, these two women being able to find their voices um, and, you know, around this particular issue and, and helping, you know, amplify their experience for others. And we want to help women in our community do that. And we are launching, um, starting the week of March 10th, a free six-week virtual journaling class called Your Story. And we encourage women to come, come together. We have, you know, a wonderful facilitator, some diverse poets, you know, too, who will be joining us and be part of you know, some of the exercises, but it really is about being able to um, think about your story, um, think about how you position your story and its impact on your life, putting it down on paper, and then learning how to share it with others, um, you know, to share your voice. And we, we so fully believe at the YWCA of Northern New Jersey that, you know, our stories are what bring us together. Our stories are what build bridges. Our stories are what heal each other. And we hope that you consider joining us to be part of our first effort of your story. Also, um, we are always uh, committed to lifting the women in our community um, as we do with YWTV um, with each broadcast. But this is March, it is Women's History Month, and this is also a time where we always offer our Women's Leadership Conference. And even during this um, different year, um, we've chosen to still uh, to share um, that lift and that inspiration, but do it a little bit differently. We're offering four conversations. We just had our first one on Monday 
They're an hour long. They're with some amazing women in our community. And we, uh, I know those of you who joined us, about the 70 women who joined us on Monday morning um, to hear Dr. Chris Purnell were you know, absolutely overwhelmed and inspired with her story. Join us next week for uh, another great conversation with Dr. Balpreet um, graywall Verk um, for her to share her story. Um, the week after, we have Janine LaRue to share her story. And the last week of our um, conversations, we have Rachel Antonoff. And um, if you don't know who these women are, which I um, think you might, but if you don't, you know, you can go to the link. We have it dropped here into the comments so you can read more about them and please sign up. Take that one hour for yourself each week this month. Um, just to disconnect, mm -hmm. lift yourself, and inspire. And we hope at the end of the month you join us for our um, virtual networking event where we can all come together and lift each other up based on such great information shared. Julia and Andrea, I'm so grateful to the two of you for taking so much time. And I know that this was a lot, a long you know, conversation, mm -hmm. but I'm very, very grateful to you. Um, it was so important, and I know that it helped so many people in our community. And please, um, you know, we're here to support and partner with you on, you know, this work, breaking the stigma and supporting um, children and families through these issues. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both.